Thank you for joining me today. Uh, thank you again to Professor Santilli and also to Carla for her help in setting this all up. Um, I'm excited to be able to talk with you today about uh, Goodell and his relationship with the EPR debate at first, and then we'll transition and talk a little bit more about the standard model and Kuhn. So that's the, uh, the order of operations. My name is Evans, you'll probably hear a little bit about me. I graduated uh, Caltech in 2014 with my PhD uh, in theoretical chemical physics. Um, I had had parts of this idea at the time, parts of it came more recently. But yeah, let's just get into it uh, with a little bit of a talk. So as I just mentioned, this is my talk, Goodell and EPR and the standard model and Kuhn. However, as you might have noticed, I have put in a little subtitle here, which uh, we'll come back and talk again about at the end called An Invention of the Death Star. It's actually 20 different inventions of the Death Star we'll talk about, but we'll, we'll hone in on one of them at the very end. Um, and yeah, welcome to the debate. So we'll start with a discussion. I'm sure we've all read it. I went back and was reading the paper, uh, the EPR paper, and quantum mechanics is not a complete theory. It's definitely what they're setting out to prove uh, in the EPR debate, um, in the EPR paper, and in subsequent follow-up papers. Uh, but the question is left unasked, I think, so what? So why do we care if quantum mechanics or any theory is complete? Um, that's not how knowledge proceeds. That's not how science proceeds. Epistemology proceeds by falsification. Whether it's Kuhn, whether it's Popper, whatever the core business of science is, it's only the falsification that leads something to be tossed aside. So if a theory is not false, then not being complete can't really be held against it, at least as far as I understand it. So, and we'll return to the point also, since falsification is the more important of the two, is completeness falsifiable? I don't know, because it seems like if you had a real case, a real incomplete space, let's say we constructed one, right? That there could always be completeness with another variable to the person philosophically committed, right? So anyway, that's my general concern. Um, let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, beyond being unimportant, um, completeness is impossible. So that's the Goodell point. That's what I want to zoom in a little bit here first is that let's assume a very basic thing for our theory of everything or any logical theory has to contain at least algebra, Boolean algebra, and the regular this, that algebra, x equals stuff algebra. Combination of those two things is the undoing within Goodell as far as I, like simplification, I'm sure, for mathematicians in the audience, but statements such as this statement is false become undecidable within logic systems that have Goodellian constructs, aka algebra. So it's a little bit hard to avoid. We have self-reference, we have Boolean algebra, or we just have algebra and algebra. We have statements like this that are problems that are undecidable. So I, I was trying to reflect on how Goodell could impact the EPR debate. And I found many of these uh, points that I will make made in a paper by Giuseppe Longo. So I, I feel obliged to reference it. He did do this before me. I was just thinking about it. Um, so we can think about, it seems a little far afield, right? Talking about very, uh, the construction of logic systems to talk about position and momentum. Is it related this uh, incompleteness to uncertainty? I think it is um, directly related and I think it, it can be seen in this kind of hand wavy way of position and momentum as being Goodell statements or related to each other. And the, the core point is basically that momentum is not unrelated to position, right? If you zoom in on what momentum is definitionally, we have mass times velocity. So, I mean, and you know, in non-relativistic frame. So um, if you zoom in on the velocity part and you say, what is velocity? Well, that's the change in position per unit time, right? So now we do have self-reference. When we're talking about both of these things at the time, we're talking about position and we're talking about change in position. They're not independent variables. They're not independent values. Nobody would expect them to be independent. Um, so that, point finds its crystallization mathematically in a little bit of a jag where you do a Fourier decomposition between any two variables and you find just how related they are. They're not independent. And so their lack of independence leads to a certain minimal amount of uncertainty by an information theory bound, by an entropic bound. So there's a pretty good paper on that um, that is below. We don't really have time to go into it now, but it's good. It also applies for energy and time, obviously. You never talk about time without talking about frequencies. You never talk about energy without talking about frequencies. 
the same general point, right? I mean, you think you know about energy independent of time, but really you're thinking about things in a steady state assumption or in a transition state assumption, right? You've taken care of time and your temporal assumptions in the framework. So time is still very much in your energetic calculation, even if your map doesn't, you know, directly reference the time. Um, now returning to the kind of my hand wave of a point about completeness not being falsifiable. Um, so not only is there the problem of Goodell and the problem uh, inherent in the use of this algebra, but it just isn't a hypothesis. It's not a scientific hypothesis because it can't be falsified, right? Being complete, which was Einstein's assumption that uh, here, it, it leads to a problem in the situation of Goodell, right? So let's say that Goodell's situation was real and we had one undecidable theorem among a bunch of other theorems. To the completionist, that one undecidable theorem isn't undecided, it's just undecided so far. It's not undecidable. So there, there's a missing possibility of undecidability. Now granted, I will grant my viewpoint here also is, is philosophical. The, basically the philosophical crux of the issue is whether or not this incompleteness is a problem. And that's just a philosophical issue. I, if, if incompleteness is a problem to you, you're welcome to try to find that hidden variable. Incompleteness, you know, it, it isn't a problem to me. Um, but like I'm saying, this is just philosophical differences. Uh, I make a, a case a little bit more heavily on um, the EPR people to make their, uh, their point, just because this is a debate. But really, you know, both of these are philosophical differences. I don't have a strong leaning one way or the other. To me, it seems like Gabellian statements are a problem for any logic system, but you know, maybe you can construct one or rules about one. But most importantly, we have a problem with logic systems that is more broad than the one covered by some parts of this debate. We've talked about Heisenberg uncertainty, and we have the point from Professor Santilli about how that is okay only in the vacuum. But that, uh, this argument applies outside of the vacuum. Any logic system where you are including um, both Boolean logic and algebra, you have this sort of problem. So it's just an additional onus to be overcome, an additional challenge to, to, to look at. So for now, I, I don't know that philosophy, but um, yeah, we can return to, to philosophical debate. That's the point of this whole thing later. But don't worry, uh, everyone on the EPR debate, um, I am about to tell you how everybody else is wrong as well. So for the rest of the debate, we're going to kind of uh, veer away from this initial point about Goodell and uh, EPR, and we're going to talk about more broadly problems with the standard model, kind of standard astronomical model mostly, but also the standard other model uh, as kind of the basis of the standard astronomical model. So there are reasons people like the standard model, obviously, besides their grants, you know, people are obviously self-interested as well, but uh, they, these advances have led to bigger bombs, satellites, QED, everybody likes Feynman, you know, there's been a lot of charismatic leaders along this way. Um, yeah, in the foundation of quantum mechanics, a lot of really good ones. But there are a number of issues that are starting to multiply. So that's kind of the point of the rest of this talk is we're going to examine the multiplication of these issues and uh, what might lead them to stop multiplying and go back down to less issues, just one issue or no issues preferred. So uh, the standard model I will be characterizing and uh, all of these parentheticals are uh, editorialized. So, you know, you can pick or choose your level of agreement with various points. You may add or subtract to the list. Of course, that's, that's uh, your prerogative. This is just my general list of problems with the uh, standard model. And I've explicated what the standard model is um, for those of you who don't know it. Basically, general relativity, quantum field theory, and uh, strong force. So that's what typically people put together. And then they mash on the Big Bang, right? So the standard astronomical model as well. So, um, but that's led to a problem. There's an ongoing, I've mentioned problems, but the biggest ones are all these dark things, right? They've got dark energy. They've got dark matter. They've got, besides that, they've got the problem of matter existing without antimatter. Matter, antimatter asymmetry has to be explained. Hyperinflation, something that, you know, is basically unmotivated and we just found it in the data. So now we have to patch on another thing to our theory. CP violation or the strong CP problem. There's no way out of that. You have to have one or the other of those two problems. Neutrino oscillations, I, I guess they just are going to tack on the CKM solution there. Um, antimatter moving backwards in time and gravitons. You know, we have to obviously have to talk about these in a little bit more detail one by one. So let's start at the top of the list with dark energy and dark matter. So 
you've, you've finished all of your physics in school. You're very happy with what you've got. You know, you just finished celebrating the Higgs boson discovery at CERN. Everybody's very happy and patting themselves on the back. I think it's been six years now. It's been a while. We need more, more things from physicists. But anyway, uh, I think this is a, a very good clue about where we will find the next big things, which are this WMAP experiment. So this is one of those crucial within the paradigm experiments um, where they don't have an explanation for what's going on. So that's why we're talking about dark energy and dark matter so much is we've seen a couple different ways before this even, where it seems like uh, when we get into intergalactic space and even galactic space, we're seeing not the distributions that Einstein would have predicted, not the distributions that GR predicts uh, of matter and antimatter. We're seeing them in weird places and specifically galaxies are both being flung apart too fast. That's the dark energy component and they are themselves being held together a little too much. And the way they're being held together is lumpy and the way they're moving apart is continuous. So we get dark energy and matter just from the lumpiness. We think of it, we're more comfortable with an energy being pervasive in background and we're more comfortable with a matter type thing being lumpy. And as far as I can tell, that's the only relation of those words to the objects because they are also dark, right? And dark just means we don't see them. They're not, they're not there. That's the other thing, right? So let's return to their actual definition of two things that, sh that are there that shouldn't be in the standard model or two different pieces of evidence that the standard model is wrong. That's as far as I can go, you know, I, I hand waved at this in the last slide a little bit, but they're, they're evidence of a problem. So the reason that we have settled on them and are kind of okay with them is that Einstein invented them first and we like Einstein. So Einstein in particular talked about dark energy and negative mass directly. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but people are currently like, oh, even though Einstein called this his biggest mistake and biggest embarrassment, maybe it's like really cool and Einstein never made any mistakes, right? So I don't know. I, seems like a dicey reason to accept something like that, but that's still not enough. Even if you did accept that and we're happy about it, you still have a fair amount, 27% of this WMAP study, not explained. So it's not good enough to just have the dark energy. You also have to have the dark matter, which is, nobody knows what it is. This is out of nowhere. People, black holes or wimps or whatever, this is just made up. The basic problem is it's not there. It's not where we think it should be. And using all the ways that we measure stuff to exist currently, light. We don't see it. Um, there's also talk about cold or hot dark matter, but once you start doing that, you're giving credit to the existence of it as a separate entity to have temperature. Come up with. It's too much for me. I can't keep going down that road at this point. Plus, you know, this is a talk. We have a limited amount of time, etc. But I had just gotten into my Einstein component of this rant, so let me indulge it a little bit further. I think you guys would be interested to know, since this is the EPR debates after all, uh, that Einstein was not, um, obviously this was not his first rodeo with Schrodinger and Hilbert and all those other guys in 1926 when he's talking about God and dice, etc. In 1918, he's already had a couple of tips with it. I mean, you can go all the way back to the beginning if you want. Einstein has his miracle year outside of academia, right? Like he was pushed aside and I kind of question whether he ever gets over being pushed aside initially like that doesn't seem like he really pushes his, his students forward. I mean, Rosen, Podolsky a little bit towards the end, but mostly we just hear about him in connection with Schwarzschild, right? right? And Schwarzschild's amazing story, amazing solution to his uh, problems, but Schwarzschild died. So the fact that that's the only guy Einstein ever really lifted up in his own work causes me some amount of concern that Einstein might have been a bit of a mean girl. So. Part of buttressing this argument for Einstein, the mean girl, is looking at this problem that Einstein had in 1918 with Schrodinger and Hilbert. Um, so Einstein had been struggling. He had the idea for um, the equivalence principle a while before he was able to get the field equations, like five years-ish. And specifically, he had been closing in on it, and then Hilbert beat him to it by about a week. Um, and so he was pretty mad about it. And then with that as the context, Schrodinger piles on. So Schrodinger writes, a, even once Einstein publishes his version of the field equations, Schrodinger piles on with, you shouldn't have included the cosmological constant. Cosmological constant is the equivalent of uniform negative mass. And finally, where is it? If it's uniform, it's here. It's right here. It's everywhere in the building. So where is it? And so that makes Einstein big mad. And we can see on the next page, it's not really controversial. Like it, it, it's an open animus. I don't know how I'm like breaking this, like breaking news to people. 
Um, this is from the response to Schrodinger's response to Einstein's field equations paper. So um, that where he's called out about a uh, cosmological constant, effectively meaning uniform negative mass. He says, when I wrote my description of the cosmic gravitational field, I naturally noticed as the obvious possibility, the variant that Herr Schrodinger had discussed, but I must confess that I did not consider this interpretation worthy of mention. Come on, man. I mean, I'm not super smart, at, especially at reading people's emotions, but boy, he is super mad here, right? Like steaming, this is something he wrote and sent off to a journal and he has got this level of condescension. He presumably edited it once for tone at least. Anyway, so basically this is at the beginning of the paper and he goes forward and he's basically like, okay, fine, Schrodinger's right at the end. And so he says, therefore a modification of the Newtonian theory is required such that empty space takes the role of gravitating negative masses, which are distributed evenly all over the space. So he says, you're right. Obviously he's right. Everybody knows Poisson's equation, it's wrong. Um, but, this is the beginning of Einstein questioning it. So Einstein had put it in, he was happy about it, he liked the static universe, but having been shown that if you move it from onto the source side, it has this effect, it made him upset. Einstein didn't like dark energy. It's true, he did propose it first, right here, gravitating negative masses distributed all over the space, but in the context of being defensive about being wrong, right? So that's not the way we want our leaps forward to the future to be, I, I guess it's fine. However you get your insights is fine, but I am a little worried about this particular source of this insight. Um, and so my general upshot of this point is I don't think it's fair to take out of context in 1926, Einstein's talk about how, oh, uh, God doesn't play dice, right? That's not just what Einstein thinks. Like he's not just like committed to that philosophically. He's also personally and emotionally committed to that, right? Because the guys who thought God played dice are not his friends. They are people who have previously disagreed with him publicly in a way that he is describing contemporaneously as his biggest embarrassment of his life. So the people who gave him this biggest embarrassment are the people inventing quantum mechanics. Of course he wants them to be wrong. Of course he would at least play around for six, eight, ten years trying to prove these guys wrong, just like they were waiting for six, eight, ten years to fix the field equations, to fix general relativity. It's tit for tat. It's human nature. But my basic point about Einstein is he didn't just think God didn't play dice. He didn't like who God was playing with. So we have to take that into consideration when we talk about Einstein's big famous pronouncement about dice. But that's also just an aside and just a fun little historical note that I thought you all would enjoy. So let's get back to it. Let's get back to tearing apart the standard model piece by piece from the top to the bottom of the list of problems. This is a big problem. So this is the anthropic principle. So just beyond all of the other fiddling we've had to do to make it so that we could be here, we have to have this principle, which basically says the universe must exist for us to exist to keep measuring it. But what's real, that's the way they've framed it. That's the way they've framed it to be reasonable, right? Because we have to be there, so it has to be here for us. But it's actually very myopic. It's very human-centric because what we're actually doing when we use the anthropic principle in the standard model is we're extrapolating our local matter-antimatter ratio to everything with no further consideration, no further thought about whether this might be the source of all of our problems. We're just saying that what it's like right here by Earth right now is what it's like everywhere all the time forever, which is crazy. I mean, like in the history of science, when has that kind of a myopic viewpoint ever been a helpful thing for a scientist? No, every time you take a step back, whether it's moving from a, an Earth-centric to heliocentric, are moving away from a heliocentric universe. This is the residue of a heliocentric universe in the current model. We must get rid of it. We must stop extrapolating our local ratio beyond any sense. Um, so that, I mean, yeah, this is just more of the same, right? So hyperinflation is an additional one. I put on the list so close to this anthropic principle one because it's related to goof. Um, and I, I can't even really explain why people accept this one as part of the standard model. Basically, the, the thing is just a, a patch where the current standard model for the last little bit works, but it doesn't work all the way back to the Big Bang, even though we also have to have it having a bang. And no, we don't know exactly why there are that many baryons and photons, et cetera, but it had to have this nature of a bang. And it's fine. It explains the data within the paradigm. Good for Goof. I like Alan. He's a very smart man kind of feel like he's one of the people who would take any 
challenger theory to his series. So that's the best credit I can give. So. But stuff is, yeah, not only moving apart too fast now, but it moved apart even faster in the past. Something's, it's, something's crazily differently wrong. We need more to the theory. Um, more of the, the, this evidence that something's wrong is CP violation. So um, there is no possibility of CP violation in the standard model unless you accept parameters like the CP violation parameter. So to me, it's not particularly useful to add a parameter that says, this is what this is. It's this, it's this parameter, you know, it's just, it's self-referential in all the worst ways and circular. So I, you know, there's always going to be another parameter. That's the beauty of CKM, right? We've got nine independent parameters we've added to the theory it can fit anything. So yeah, it fits everything. Great. But yes, by construction, because you've made it fit everything. So I don't see why, how it's come to pass muster as a, as a hypothesis. Um, but even if you did like CKM, you would have the problem with, even if you like the CP violation parameter and that was enough for you and you were patting yourself on the back and you're saying, great, we got it. Great job, Kabibo, Kobayashi, all these guys. You still don't have it because then you have to answer the question, why isn't CP violated in the strong force? Why isn't it the case? You've just finished telling me this is the CP violation parameter. So presumably it continues to exist in nuclei. Well, why don't they decay? Why don't nucleons decay? So either there isn't a CP violation parameter or we have a strong CP problem. Why doesn't the CP violation parameter exist in strong force situations? Regardless, it's just a mess. There's a problem here. Everybody recognizes there's a problem here. And then yeah, neutrino oscillations, everybody recognizes there's a problem. And honestly, the patchwork solution is just garbage. It's like, it's a, it's a hand wave analog of what's going on with the CKM model. And then, no, it just is for this, and it doesn't have any other physical significance, and we haven't tried anything else like thermodynamic equilibrium, other, other possibilities. So um, beyond that, maybe I should have left off the list. It's just a, it's awful. awful. Uh, so standard model number seven, failure, antimatter, antimatter moving backwards in time. Physicists get far along, enough along in their education, and they forget this is a problem. But then you go and you ask any person, human being, about this, and you ask them, hey, does stuff go backwards in time? Anything. And if so, what was the big experiment? You know, like we have the double slit experiment. That's when we, you know, we had to get some sense about there being a probabilistic component to travel of particles, etc. cetera. Um, but when did we have this experiment for stuff moving in backwards in time? We didn't. What happened was we had the uh, philosophical, maybe theological is what I was going to say, necessity of it. We needed it in order for our physics to work, in order for QED, in order for Feynman diagrams to work. And so we just used it, no questions asked. And now all of our antimatter moves backwards in time and no, nobody's ever measured it and nobody's planning to measure it. And there are no, as far as I'm aware, tests to measure it separately from saying, oh, QED worked, so great, this is fine. Now that's great, QED does ha have some of the most impressive, um, you know, what ab initio relation to experiment is very good to many digits, but no stuff doesn't move backwards in time and they've never shown it did. So, okay, last, oh, oops. Uh, the last problem, gravitons not normalized. I only bring this up as a specific problem because generally this is presented a little bit more as a, who's gonna win quantum mechanics or is it gonna be gravity or, or a general relativity? That's not a fight. General relativity is one thing that kind of works in some places. Quantum field theory is better than it. It explains all of the other things that work in all of the other places. So it's like big thing and little thing bump on a log. And specifically, I don't know, general relativity to me, it's explaining the weakest force as a perturbation on nothing. Well, maybe that is a fiction, right? Maybe that's just a convenient thing to do locally because it's so weak. So anyway, I, I think what we can do is we can expect gravitons exist and they can be normalized. So, um, and if they were normalized, we'd be in some good shape. So we have a bunch of problems with the standard model. I've titled this talk Kuhn and the Standard Model. Let's talk about what Kuhn brings to the table here. Many of you are probably Popperian epistemologists. You're used to the idea of there being a scientific method that we're putting forward hypotheses. They are being proven, dis I'm sorry, never proven, only disproven. They're being falsified and tossed aside. Um, and we're being left with the best possible overall uh, book of ideas. But that, to me, is not exactly what science really is, from my experience, from watching it, from grant committees, from all that. Um, what really seems to happen is people 
are taking what they've learned in school and applying it to problems that can either make them money or otherwise are interesting to them for some reason, but basically they think they know what's gonna happen. So that's, that's the Kuhnian way of looking at the way that, that knowledge progresses. And it basically progresses through people learning stuff and applying that knowledge, not exactly haphazardly, but not in a directed fashion. There's no sense as in Popper that we're progressing towards something that each experiment is an attempt at falsification. In real life, we know that's not the case. There's not a real big question mark with every experiment or even every you know, theoretical paper. In general, you know what you're gonna get before you set out to get it. And you did some calculations and good, it took you a few days. You're doing hard questions like it's, uh, like it's a problem set. But that's all it is. It's just a problem set and it's not real life. It's not how knowledge actually proceeds. So with, that's called following the paradigm. The paradigm is the received wisdom from your elders that you are then applying to new problems as you see them, new problems being defined only within the paradigm so you never are able to see the problem with it. Um, and that is then, you know, the word paradigm shift has taken on a life outside of Kuhnian epistemology. So you probably are familiar with the idea that all at once, once you have a big enough set of problems with something, you have people in the streets causing a paradigm shift or whatever it is, something causes a paradigm shift and the sense isn't that we've learned something new or something has been falsified. It's just that the received wisdom that we had that caused us to conceptualize problems a certain way has failed. So we have taken on a new wisdom and that wisdom did not fail. So it's, it's similar to the Popperian epistemology point in terms of how the shift takes place. There is one decisive moment of falsification of our paradigm but it's a sweeping one and it's been chipped at several times. Like we expect there to be multiple falsifications that are small and then one crucial experiment that demands a change. So what's our evidence that this is now? Well, all of the theoretical physics books in this picture, I just looked for a few of them I remembered reading recently. I like Jorge Cham and uh, I have worked with him previously on movies, the PhD movie, go check it out. Um, but so besides that, you can see everybody has the same point. Reality is not what it seems. The trouble with physics, we don't know. We have no idea. Lost in the math, not even wrong is a, yeah, a great book. But so um, they know something's wrong. These are guys with brains. These are guys working within the paradigm and we're getting to the point where there is a problem. And so, um, yeah, so I talked a little bit about this on the last page. The, the I talked about what a paradigm is. What causes it to it, a shift is when our dictionaries are insufficient and when we have a crucial experiment that can't be explained within the paradigm. It wasn't what you're expected in a big way. So what I'm saying is yes, I think that we can get rid of all these eight things with one paradigm shift. Um, one uh, of these uh, crazy experiments, let's see, anything more? Yeah, oh, basically my point is to shift the paradigm the easiest, right? You wanna very slightly change the uh, received wisdom. Because if you make a bunch of changes, it's gonna be harder to convince people of each change, right? Like people are piecewise learners and you're never gonna get them to throw away everything they've learned. So you wanna take what they've learned and, and give it that tweak so that the old paradigm can become the new paradigm. So, and then you wanna figure out what's gonna cause people to accept that tweak. Uh, and that's gonna be the, um, the crucial experiment, the big experiment that they can't explain. For me, I think that's negative mass, positive energy, antimatter. But in general, I think that's just negative mass antimatter. So my, my big moment uh, realizing this was on a plane coming home in 2013 for Christmas, I think. I was looking out the window of the plane, saw some stars, and I wondered about those stars. I thought, wait, how do I know the light coming from those stars isn't, isn't antimatter's light? And within the paradigm, you don't. The, the uh, energy levels are supposed to be exactly the same. And so when you approach the overall astronomical problem with the sense, hey, there's no... Uh, we don't know what's far away, then the assumption in the anthropic principle becomes crazy. All the darks fall into place. So the only problem is that if you had negative mass antimatter, you immediately, we love Einstein, E equals MC squared. What about the negative energy? I think that's wrong. So that's my big paper thing, whatever, is that the norm of the energy momentum vector is the, the quantity. That's the thing that is normalized. Norm, normalization, that's the important part. And the E equals MC squared thing is a derived quantity that comes from solving for a single energy component of that normal ve vector norm. So when you take that square root, you have to be careful because when you take the square root of M squared C to the fourth, the answer is not MC squared. That's one of the solutions, but the correct answer from an algebra perspective is this plus or minus 
absolute value of mc squared. So if you did have negative mass antimatter, it wouldn't have negative energy, at least within the same energy solution set as the matter that has positive energy. There may also be another solution set, whatever. But the other important thing that this results in is a spin two graviton. Because a spin two graviton, I was just reading the Feynman lectures on gravity in 2018, that's what made the other piece of this puzzle come into place, is that opposites would repel and like charges uh, would uh, attract. So like charges would attract, we already knew that for masses attracting, but that would mean that opposites repel naturally within the same exact kind of spin field charge carry or whatever they're calling it theory. So I like the idea of quantum field theory with this negative mass, getting rid of all the problems, being what happens with the paradigm shift because dark energy then becomes gravity. It's the gravity between things far away and here. And uh, dark matter, why is it lumpy? Well, it's because the stuff over there is lumpy and we're projecting it onto here. Um, what's going on with the anthropic principle? Don't need it anymore. No symmetry breaking, equal amounts of both. Uh, what's going on with hyperinflation? Well, that's just gravity too. If you think about in the proto universe when stuff's breaking apart, whatever was holding it together has just finished. And so now your average distance is as close as it's ever gonna be. So the inflation being faster back then makes sense. It's natural, it makes sense. Um, same thing with CP violation. Did you guys know that CP violation was predicted from a negative mass anti-maze, anti-quark. That was done by ML Good three to four years before they found out about CP violation in mesons. The difference was he didn't believe it. Like he, he said, okay, if there was a negative mass quark, we should see it and we should see it because there should be CP violation in mesons. And then they found CP violation in mesons and no one was like, oh, maybe that's because of a negative mass anti-quark. Nobody returned to it, including him. So, you know, I'm returning to it now. I think that's a good theory for mesons. Um, neutrino oscillations, thermal fluctuations wasn't really part of the talk, but antimatter moving backwards in time, if you think about negative mass, you don't need that to move backwards in time. It's a negative mass moving forwards in time. So sure, it's one thing we're a little bit uncomfortable with, with negative mass, we've never used the word before, but you expect like a high schooler could understand that and much more easy to understand than backwards in time motion and easy to test, right? We're gonna have tests for negative mass antimatter. So anyway, that's uh, the last thing is just a hand wave. If we have any mathematicians in the audience, I haven't been able to work this up. It's been two years. This is low-hanging fruit. The, the surface of net zero mass guaranteed by this model should make it so you can normalize a graviton, right? I mean, you can integrate around a surface that you couldn't before. It's an extra constraint. So it should solve that problem. Uh, and then this is just my, you don't have to take my word for it, reading rainbow um, uh, slide. There's a bunch of different people thinking this. It's not just Professor Santilli's ISO dual universe. There's the chardin levy model, which is Dirac-Milne uh, universe. I'm, I'm working with them a little bit as well. Velata's universe, which some people have said is isomorphic to some of the other ones. Um, there's imaginary energy universes, gravitational dipole universes. There's a bunch of these models where we expect if Newton had been under an anti-apple, the anti-apple wouldn't fall and hit him. It would fly away. Um, and then there's a bunch of other people who have mentioned the, um, the idea separately from an overarching model and the people who are running the actual experiment. So I haven't mentioned it, but we're going to know kind of soon, probably, although people have been saying we're going to know kind of soon, probably for seven years. Um, these experiments at CERN had taken a back seat to the Higgs boson experiments. Now, presumably, they'll get to them, although nobody really thinks they're going to find anything. So these are, they're not as good as Professor Santilli's horizontal flight experiment um, in terms of being, you know, obvious and, and the best simple explanation, simple experiment to do. But they are essentially versions of a Newton having an anti-apple that are better than, you know, the E. Otvos experiments. People have sometimes have tried to hand wave away antimatter's mass with those, but they're making all sorts of assumptions that are wrong and bad as well. Um, okay, so yeah, I'll leave you with this. I think that this uh, negative mass antimatter thing might be as important as calculus when you look back on it. Leibniz and Newton both having those ideas at the same time. If you scale up the population in their day to the population in our day, if there were an idea as big as calculus now, 20 people should be discovering it simultaneously. So, hey, last page, 20 people, 20 different uh, inventions of it. I think we might be onto something. So here are your, your open questions for um, the, the theory. We'll get back to the debate in a second, but the uh, what is the negative M Energetic solution, we've got some ideas from Professor Santilli with his ISO dual universe. We've got some ideas from um, Sakharov had some ideas for this. Um, so there's some interesting ideas about what it might be generally considered to be 
not measurable part of this universe has to be philosophical conclusion. Um, and how can gravitons be normalized? I already talked about that. Then some, some ongoing concerns about whether or not um, physicists will ever accept the end of physics. I, I'm not sure that they will. I, uh, what's his name? Um, Feynman had a whole college lecture on whether or not what, what physicists should do once they do finish the theory of everything. Um, but yeah, so you might have noticed the tag to my talk is missing. You came in here thinking about a Death Star. Where's the Death Star, right? Well, those of us who believe in negative mass antimatter also think that we have already seen it several times. So whether it's the Great Chicago Fire, come on, the, the barn story with the cow, ridiculous. There were four different fires around that Great Lake that night that seemed suggestive that there might have been something that came in the sky and caused a big fire all around the Great Lake, um, such as an antimatter asteroid. You know, they have to be tiny or else they'd be repelled by the Earth. Uh, but even tiny asteroids have a big boom, right? That's the problem here is that when you get rid of just a proton or just a neutron, that gave you the nuclear bomb. Now we're getting rid of all of it and twice of it, right? We're getting rid of it and its anti-partner and turning it into energy. It's a lot worse, like 100 to 1,000 times than a nuclear bomb, depending on how many neutrons the nuclear bomb was uh, using for energy. So it's a problem. Um, however, and, and I did some calculations, you can calculate that a big enough payload to destroy Earth could be fired from geosynchronous orbit. So that's why I call it the Death Star. I think it would be single use because that's pretty close, right? The real Death Star was far away, it used a little laser thing, and it got away at the end. So it's like a disposable Death Star, but we could do a Death Star if we wanted to. All that's stopping us is the ability to create that amount of antimatter and shoot it. So Sadly, that's all that was missing when Einstein came up, you know, 1905, he has his energy mass equivalence. It only takes 39 years to turn that into a nuclear bomb. So here's hoping the engineers never believe us uh, that they don't, they don't turn this into a Death Star with their ever increasing Moore's Law certainty speed increase. So back to the debate, everyone, let's talk a little bit more about Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen um, and its relation to Goodell and uh, yeah, Happy to talk about the Death Star, too. I know that's a fun part. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Sintilli.